So uh, it actually just kind of worked out because last last Wednesday um, I was supposed to speak because Pastor Dave and Elena were gone, and I was going to continue where we were two weeks ago, but last week we had snow and things just worked out. Go figure. So uh, we are going to be back in Romans chapter four. So if you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, go ahead and turn there. Romans chapter four, and we'll be in verses. 18 through 25. Uh, as a refresher, because I know we've all slept since two weeks ago, um, at least I hope we have. Uh, <clears throat> so it's easy to believe in God and have hope when we can see an answer to whatever situation that we might be experiencing, right? Whether it's from health issues or financial issues or from a marriage standpoint. But on the other hand, when we can't see the answer, it's not nearly as easy. And we kind of talked about that, those situations a couple weeks ago. But the goodness for all of us is that no matter how hopeless the situation might look right now, God provides the ability to have hope even when we can't see any possible solution. And those are the but God moments that we talked about a couple weeks ago. Uh, and now, like I said, we're going to be in Romans chapter 4, and we're going to start at verse 18 and then read through verse 25. So let's go ahead and go there. Against all hope, Abraham and hope believed, and so became the father of many nation, nations, just as it had been said to him. So shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us, to, for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. So if you remember, I, I had pointed out that Paul begins this section with something of an oxymoron. That... He writes, in hope, Abraham believed against hope. And this was kind of a Hebrew expression to contrast the two different kinds of hope. And the two kinds of hope that we're talking about here is hope that is really nothing more than wishful thinking. And the example I used was hoping that the Cubs win the World Series again. Um, But then there's also the biblical hope that's much different than that. It's not wishful thinking. The Greek word that is translated hope means something more like confident expectation or the expectation of what is sure. And in this passage we just read, we can see that Abraham had biblical hope even when he couldn't see any possible way for God's promise to him to be fulfilled. And here's how we can summarize biblical hope. Biblical hope is a matter of trusting that God's promise is greater than my predicament. God's promise is greater than my predicament. It's the but God kind of hope. Abraham was an old man and he still hadn't had a son. So he took matters into his own hands and had a son through Sarah's servant. But that wasn't the promise that God had given Abraham. When he was 99 years old, God comes to Abraham and promises him that he will have another son. And this is the one that was going to fulfill the promise that had been made many years earlier. And remember, remember this, that God changes Abraham's name from Abram, meaning exalted father, to Abraham, which means father of multitude. So I have to imagine that as Abraham looked at the situation from his point of view, his life was very hopeless. 
But as Paul points out here, even in the midst of that worldly hopelessness, Abraham somehow developed biblical hope that allowed him to persevere through long years when he couldn't see any answers. So the first two points that we covered a couple weeks ago were consult God's word. That's point number one. Point number two is consider my circumstances. So point number one, we saw how Abraham had consulted God's word at the end of verse 18. We we can see these crucial words, which we can easily overlook if we're not careful. And these are the words that, that are in verse 18. As he had been told. Consulting God's word. As he had been told. Abraham did give careful consideration to the situation. But before that, he first considered the promise that God had made to him. And this is a very important lesson for us as well. When I'm going through a situation that seems to be hopeless, the very first thing I need to do is go to the Bible and reflect on the promises of God. That's the very first thing that I need to do. And obviously, this first step requires that I'm constantly spending time in God's Word so that I can be aware of these and other promises that might apply to my particular situation. Only after I've taken the time to do that can I really take the next step into point number two, which is we can see that Abraham did not turn a blind eye to his circumstances. So in verse 19, we see Abraham considered the deadness of his own body, being 99 years old and the barrenness of Sarah's womb. And we can see this. Let's go ahead and read verse 19. Without weakening his faith, He faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, being 99 years old, since he was about 100 years old. I say 99, it's about 100. So, uh, And that Sarah's womb was also dead. What this is basically saying is that Abraham faced the facts, right? Even though people lived longer in Abraham's time, at 99 years old, Abraham was certainly past the time of fathering days. Right, And even at 89, Sarah had gone through a lot of changes as well, that she was no longer capable of carrying a child. But God. We can also see in verse 19 that the faith and hope that they had, and as we often believe, requires us to deny or ignore the facts of our situation. We we see here that it's not in any way unspiritual to carefully consider our circumstances. But it has to be in view of this. The lens of the Word of God. Abraham didn't just give casual thoughts to his circumstances. He carefully considered them. And he came to the correct conclusion that from a human perspective, there was no way that he and Sarah could have a child. From a human's perspective. But by the world's definition, and by the world's definition, there was there was no hope. And yet, in the midst of the worldly hopelessness, Abraham still believed the kind of biblical hope that led him to believe God. And how did he do that? He didn't just stop at that point and have pity have a pity party for himself. He moved to the next critical step that we see from this passage. And this is where I left you all in suspense two weeks ago. Okay. So let's continue our journey. So we have that Abraham <clears throat> consulted God's word. We have that he considered the circumstances. And then number three, contemplating God's power. In verse 19, we see that Abraham did not weaken his faith when he considered his circumstances. And then in verse 20, we see that he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. And this verse in particular really causes me to stop and to think about what Paul has written here. We have to realize that Abraham is far from perfect. And there were undoubtedly times in his life where his unbelief had really caused him to waver. And it seems to me that what Paul means here is that looking at the overall pattern of Abraham's life and certainly at the final result, Abraham showed constant faith to the promises of God. And that is unquestionably shown 
when Abraham is obedient to God's command to sacrifice Isaac. The son who was the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. Unquestionably. So as Abraham considered his dead body and Sarah's dead womb, he remembered that he had a God who, as we can see in verse 17, gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. What a powerful passage. Let's read that again. God, our God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of, of Mary, the God of Joseph, gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. If you think about the creation story, there was nothing. The earth was formless. But God, the Word became flesh through Jesus. God calling everything out of nothing. Life out of death. So even, even though Abraham couldn't bring back to life the deadness of his body, God could. And even though Sarah couldn't bring new life into the existence out of the barrenness of her body, God could. <laughs> and Abraham wasn't merely an optimist who practiced positive thinking. That's not what Abraham did. Their faith was solidly God-centered rather than man-centered. Abraham didn't believe in himself or the power of his words. He believed in the power of God who could do whatever was needed to fulfill the promises that he had made. So imagine this. God takes Abraham out and he says, okay, look at the stars and your, your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars. What? No. I don't even have a son. But God. When Abraham exercised his faith, it was not merely belief in what God had promised, but it was complete confidence in the character of God, who is 100% faithful to do what he has promised and who has the power to fulfill those promises. Let me say that again. God is 100% percent faithful. These, these situations that Pastor Dave has mentioned earlier about these unspoken requests, we don't know what the outcome is going to be. We, but here's the thing, we don't need to. As much as we want to know, we don't need to. But it's so hard to just sit, right? It's so hard to mull over these things. It's so hard to chew on them because we want to know. We're left in the dark. But imagine how Abraham got this promise that you're gonna, your descendants are going to be more numerous than the stars. But God, how is that going to happen? But then, but God. Because God made it happen. Because our God is 100% faithful. Do you believe that? I believe it. There have been situations recently that I've been, I've been facing that I've been thinking about with you all knowing what some of you are going through. And I've really had to sit. I've really had to think. And I've really had to pray. And I even just, yeah, with just situations that I've been going through. God, are you 100% faithful? God, are you going to do what only you can in this situation? And in one of these situations, um, Restoration is really hard when you work with imperfect people, right? I'm imperfect. You're imperfect. Relatives are imperfect. <laughs> but there has been a situation that has been going on for quite some time within my family. And the way that God has taken this story and taken the messiness of it, the hurt, the why, why didn't you do this or why haven't you done that? But the way that God has used that for his glory 
I, w- I even just had a conversation today. I, I didn't have a conversation. I was eavesdropping. So, <laughs> but it was being told to someone who, it was being told to my mom, so I'll just say that. But the situation that I'm thinking of in particular God using his goodness in the midst of this and making a messy situation and turning it around for his glory and to draw people to himself. Only God can do that kind of thing. We're imperfect. We mess up. But when we share our stories... God can use that for his glory. That's what we can see with the story of Abraham. And we can have hope just like Abraham because Abraham knew and trusted in God's power and not his own. So point number four, contribute my part. So although the birth of Isaac happened because of a supernatural intervention of God, the fulfillment of God's promise required the participation of Abraham and Sarah. Okay, I'm not going to say anything more about that. Um, But in verse 21, we see that Abraham was fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. And this is the perfect definition of the kind of faith that Paul had been writing about in this section because Abraham was fully convinced that God was able to carry out his promise. He responded with obedience. And there, there are two important things to note in this passage. First, we often find that in order for God to accomplish His purposes in our lives, we have to join in the work that He is already doing and do our part. Just thinking about the situation, too, um, that, that I just mentioned. This person in this situation could just roll over and be in the pit of despair and go, oh, woe is me, why me, that kind of thing. But this person is actually using the situation that they're going through to bring people to God. So the second thing is that we, we need to note is, is when we're to enter into this process. We tend to do things backward from what we see in this passage. When we come to what seems to be a hopeless situation, our natural tendency is to jump in and act before we consider what God may want to do through our circumstances. We want to fix it. And then we just ask God to bless what we've already decided to do without seeking Him in any of it. I'm, I'm guilty of doing that. I'm so guilty of doing that. But as we clearly see here, we are only to act after we first have consulted God's Word and consider our circumstances and then contemplating God's power. And obviously, God is capable of doing whatever He wants to do without me. Let me say that again. God is capable of doing whatever He wants to do without you. (laughs) Without me. But, we see consistently in the Bible that God chooses to work through people and that He often invites us to join in that work He's already doing to contribute to to that work just like this situation that I mentioned a few moments ago. And the only way we're going to be able to discern what part God wants us to play in that process is to seek Him in His Word and through prayer. Point number five. Give glory to God. Give glory to God. So look at the last phrase in verse 20. The last part of verse 20. Yet, uh, let's go to the beginning of verse 20. Yet he did not waver through his unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. 
the verb grew strong means to put power into. And this is a form of the Greek word from which we get our English word dynamite. And whenever we face a situation that seems hopeless to us, God is at work in our lives to strengthen our faith. Notice here that giving glory to God is not primarily a matter of our words. And we certainly can, can and should give God glory by singing songs of praise like we do on Sunday mornings or with a group of friends or in the car by ourselves or just giving glory to God in whatever fashion we, we see fit. But it's more a matter of how we live than what we say. How we sing, what we sing, what we say, big deal. But how do you live? How do you show people that God is actually at work in your life? If we were to go back through the accounts of God's repeated promise to Abraham in Genesis, you wouldn't be able to find one instance where Abraham gave glory to God with the words that he spoke. But what you will find is that Abraham consistently gave glory to God by living his life in a way that demonstrated his complete confidence in the promises of God and in his character. That's how he gave God glory. We might get done early. (laughs) But that's okay. So a couple weeks ago, uh, when I was closing... Um, I gave you the name of a song that I encourage you all to go check out. Did anybody? No, don't raise your hands. <laughs> because I am actually going to play you that song right now so that you can listen to it to see how it fits into this account that we've read, the account of Abraham, the account of Sarah. But this, this song is... Um, it's sung by Larnell Harris, and um, the first time I heard this song, it, I remember sitting in my office, and I was on YouTube, by the way, so uh, that's, a, that's a joke that we have with our staff, and anyways, <laughs> but I was on YouTube, I did find this song, and I knew of Larnell Harris, and Larnell sings with the Gaithers, and even though I'm 34 years old, I enjoy listening to the Gaithers. So uh, I feel like I'm, I'm okay. You guys are okay with me saying that. So uh, I, love, I love that music. Um, but this song, I remember listening to it the first time. But I remember crying because of the two words that I've said over and over and over again two weeks ago and then even tonight. The but God. Remember, as you listen to this song, remember Abraham's example of what to do when the going gets rough. And my prayer is that the words of this song will saturate your soul so that you can go into whatever circumstances you're facing and say a couple of things. The first thing is, but God. And the second thing is, God alone. No other answer but God, right? My prayer is that over the past three weeks, now that it's all been said and done, is that this message is a good reminder for all of us That when we face tough circumstances, biblical hope is a matter of trusting that God's promise is greater than our predicament. But God. I don't know what you're facing. I only live my life. (laughs) And that's plenty enough for me. But God is faithful in keeping his promises. I know we've all seen that in our lives. 
Don't give up. Don't give up on God. Because he's right there with you. No matter what. So let me pray for us. And then, if you want to stick around, great. If you want to leave, that's okay too. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. God, that from the beginning to the end, you are in all of it. And the fact that we have your word and we can look to it every day is something so powerful. God, for the times that we take that for granted, that that we take the promises of you for granted. God, forgive us. Just like we hear, we've heard from, from Pastor Dave, God and Jesus are not just genies in a lamp that you go to and rub the lamp and ask for something to happen. God, there's nothing better than having a relationship with you. So Father, help all of us whether or not we're going through a situation right now, it's guaranteed that we will. So Father, help us to trust You. Help us to know that You are 100% faithful in every situation. And God, in, in the times where we just want to lose it, where we just want to, we just want to, we might lose our temper. We might lose our, our, our minds a little bit. God, whatever it may be, Father, help us to trust you in those moments because you're faithful. God, take us from this place. Keep us safe. Help us to be your hands and feet. God, those who come across our path, help us not to just push those people aside. Help us to have your mind, your, your mind and, and your, your eyes to even consider those who we come in contact with on a daily basis. Help us to invest in those people. Help us not to give up on those people because you haven't given up on me. So Father, we trust you and we look to you. And it's in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.